scripture reading today comes from Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And we'll be reading two translations this morning, starting with the English Standard Version. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And the King James Version. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This morning, uh, Jacob asked me before service started, why do we have two translations? Uh, that's a great question. And uh, the message is saying the same thing. But you'll note as you, as you read one and then read the other translations, uh, the wording is a little bit different. And with different wording comes different uh, connotation, different context, uh, different understanding, if you will. And our understanding uh, of a certain word can change generation from generation. And uh, so I want to talk about Jesus' healing ministry. And uh, we know that Jesus healed many people. That was part of the ministry that he was called to here on earth. And we talk a little bit about those, uh, the healing that he did, but I'm also going to focus a bit on the healing of the brokenhearted. We don't hear, as we read through scripture, the emphasis on the healing of the broken heart. We hear about the lame man, who's healed, the one who lies beside the pool, the blind man, the deaf man, the lepers, and, and uh, the bleeding woman, and, and so on. And as our young at heart taught us this morning, the healing of a child who wasn't feeling well. We hear about that, but we don't hear as much about the healing of the broken heart. And so I want to uh, ask you to keep that in mind for today's message. There once was a pulpit supply pastor. He went around church to church filling in when the church's pastor wasn't available. Maybe, maybe the pastor was on vacation or attending a seminar or a conference or continuing education or sabbatical. And as such, he became a familiar figure in this tri-county region. And when he wasn't preaching and leading worship, he would often be found doing some kind of outreach work alongside one of the churches. Now, he didn't have a church of his own. He never did, really. One week, he helped with the church's vacation Bible school. Another week, he went on a mission trip with three churches combined. He could be found at Peter's Pantry in Manitowoc or Bridgeway here in Sheboygan, helping to feed the hungry, to comfort the heavily burdened hearts of single moms. Another Sunday, he joined a congregation and community in their annual outdoor worship service, followed by a community meal and dancing. Jesus even approved. This preacher approved <laughs> Uh, polka music. Yeah, he was a wise teacher, a very good preacher. He had a way with children. And he shared great children's messages. He, had a good, he enjoyed a good laugh and, and uh, a good time just as much as the next person. And often he stayed around after the worship service had ended for fellowship and would drink coffee and eat donuts and wonderful baked treats that were brought in by beloved church members. 
He could be found telling more stories to children or listening to an elder as she shared her story of her own children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Well, one Sunday, he was in this area, the, the Man Manitowoc and Sheboygan area, leading worship for a small rural, rural church, maybe 30, 35 in attendance. Interestingly enough, this is very near where he had grown up. In fact, he knew some of the people in attendance from when he was a young boy. And his message on this day was not his normal delivery. The reading of scripture was followed by a statement, not a sermon. And there was no children's message. There was no community prayer. He read one verse from uh, that morning from Isaiah of the Old Testament. It was Isaiah 61, verse 1. You may recognize it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the year of the Lord's favor. And his statement to the people that morning was simply this. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah comes true. And there was a, a murmuring of the voices as people sat in, their, in the pews and uh, they were amazed. And they marveled at the words coming from the mouth of this itinerant preacher. And then the young man told the people of the works of Elijah and Elisha, uh, other Old Testament prophets. And he said, their good works are mighty, but my works will be mightier still. Now, this wasn't what the people expected to hear, especially from someone they had known since childhood. And from an amazed voice to an angry voice, the murmuring and the undertone changed and grew louder and soon filled with fury the people took the young man to the tallest cliff that they could find with all intents to push him off it unto his own death. But somehow this itinerant preacher walked away, walked right through their midst without them touching him. Perhaps it sounds like a familiar story. <laughs> I kind of gave it away halfway through the story. It's the story that we find in Luke chapter 4 of Jesus coming back to his hometown and preaching. He had gathered in the, the sanctuary, the synagogue, with all of the people, and they had sifted through uh, Old Testament text. Of course, there was no New Testament at that time. And they gave him, handed over Isaiah 61 verse 1 and asked him to read this. And what he would normally do then would be to read the text and then share wisdom from it. But in this case, he didn't. He read the text, Isaiah 61 verse 1. And then he said that today... This prophecy is coming true. True in me. And the people were so angry to hear this from this man who had been a young boy growing up in their midst. And they sought to stop him. Jesus is about to begin this itinerant ministry for which he was sent to the world. He would go on to proclaim the good news to the poor. And, and the good news in and of itself is of many things. It, it's a promise of God's love and grace and mercy. It is a promise of better things to come. It is a promise of healing to the wounded and the brokenhearted. Not just the physically hurting, the lame or the mute, the deaf, the blind, the dying, but to the brokenhearted as well, to those who are outcast, ostracized, oppressed, 
to those whom others want to treat differently when all they themselves want is to be treated the same. Now it's easy to see outward signs of brokenness. It's easy to see the old man lying beside the pool with withered thin legs, the crutch lying right beside him. He's lame. He can't walk. That's easy to see. It's hard to see brokenness on the inside. You can't tell when someone walking down the street might feel anxious or depressed or broken hearted. Uh, a teenage relationship. One that you think will last forever. If you remember back in your teenage years, perhaps you had that first love. And you were filled with dreams and expectations of what life would be like after high school together. And then something happened to end that relationship. Maybe it was just falling out of love. Maybe it was a betrayal. And the angst and the emotion of losing that first love leaves a deep and long-lasting impact, an imprint on your heart, one that you'll never forget and one that you think will never heal. Or you find that you do marry your high school sweetheart and 40, 50, 60 years pass being together when one of you is brought home to rest forever in the arms of the Lord. And you are happy, you are overjoyed that your loved one <coughs> has, gone, has gone home. Excuse me. You are happy and overjoyed that your loved one has gone home, but you are saddened, heartbroken, grief-stricken, and beside yourself because your loved one has gone home, and you're still here. Or maybe you walk through life never quite fitting in, never quite sure if you'll be accepted for who you are, always feeling like you're on the outside looking in and never on the inside looking out. These are profound, deep wounds that aren't always visible to others. But you carry them with you. <coughs> they are just as, if not more so, as painful as a physical malady. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> they are just as, if not more so, as painful as a physical malady. And you find yourself in need of healing. Now when Jesus walked this earth, people... <coughs> I don't know if I'm going to make it through this, friends. <coughs> I know, I know. I think I'm in need of healing. <coughs> I came to the right place. Amen to that. Two men in Capernaum had heard of Jesus and his healing ministry. They called to him when he walked by. He said, have mercy on us, son of David. Jesus, touching their eyes, gave them sight. Or a leper came to Jesus and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, make me clean. And Jesus reached out and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was gone. Jesus healed a demon-possessed man, a woman who was ill, the son of a soldier man, and a child who had died, the daughter of Jairus. Time and time again, Jesus healed physically. But what's often overlooked is that he healed internally, communally, and socially as well. In Jesus' time, a respectable Jewish teacher wouldn't dare continue, or wouldn't dare consider taking a, a female student under his care and instruction. It was, after all, a patriarchal society. We just don't teach the women. Thank God that's changed. 
nor would he engage with someone who had chronic illness or, or disability since it was believed to be a testament to that person's poor character or poor lineage. Nor would he ever cross the socio-ethno-political lines that would prevent him from talking to and healing the heart of the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus didn't just cross the line. <laughs> he went out of his way to break those lines. He broke down the barriers which prevented us from loving one another and he built up those bridges to connect people to each other. Uh, the leper Jesus healed was considered unclean by everyone and he was forced to live separately from everyone else, isolated by his, by his self. Yet he ached to be accepted and welcomed and to be part of the community. He wanted more than anything to be accepted and valued for who he was. Instead he was shunned and avoided and he never knew the compassionate touch of another person until Jesus spoke to him, touched him and healed him. Not only was his physical disease gone but now he could rejoin the community. He could have a place in society where he was accepted and wanted and valued and welcomed. But Jesus sought to include everyone in his ministry, giving them a place to belong by treating all people with value and respect. And this meant crossing that line many times. There once was a woman who was demon-possessed. But because of Jesus' compassion, this woman would go on to find her health and become one of the most influential people ever associated with Jesus. Her name? Mary Magdalene. And just the fact that we know about her, we, knew, we know her name over 2,000 years later, is a testament to the barriers that Jesus successfully erased, oftentimes just by ignoring them. <laughs> Jesus offers healing today as much as he did then. He offers healing through his own example of being compassionate. His compassion allowed that he could, would, and did talk to those whom others often ignored. He would compassionately touch those who were ill. He would not only cross the socio-ethno-political lines, but he would physically travel to out-of-the-way areas to share the good news of God's love. But much like our own mission team is getting ready to do in just a couple of weeks to go out and share the good news of God's love with others. <clears throat> he offers healing through his own example of listening. He would sit down and listen to people. The power of a listening ministry is, is something, people. We live in a world where slowing down, sitting down, just listening to others is often neglected. But by listening to someone else's story, we not only learn more about that person, but by the end of our time together, that person knows that they are valued because you sat and listened to them. They are of importance. They matter. And of course they do. He offers healing through his own example of walking with the people. They say we should never criticize another person unless we have walked a mile in their shoes. And I think the joke goes to something like this. We should never criticize another person unless we've walked a mile in their shoes because then we'll be a mile away from them and we'll have their shoes. <laughs> Jesus didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. He spent time with those in need. He spent time in their community, in their homes, eating meals together, uh, going to wedding celebrations. And he knew their pain. <clears throat> and that's how true healing can begin. We reach out and touch the person. We listen to their story. We spend time with them and true healing begins. A healing of the heart. Finding joy once again. 
uh, not just feeling, but knowing you are important. You matter. You are loved. Thanks be to God for this healing ministry. Amen. Friends, let's take a moment now for prayer. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is, uh, uh, is to offer up an opportunity for you to lift any prayer concerns you might have, any praises or joys or celebrations, anything happening in your life that you want to give thanks to God for or to have us join with you as your church family in prayer. Uh, just a couple from St. James this morning from our early service. Uh, Joanne Fessler's brother, Alan, Alan and Elaine were in that automobile accident some time ago. And Alan is, is facing, they're facing some difficult uh, decisions with Alan, um, including deciding whether to amputate his leg or to continue uh, trying to repair it. And so we pray for Alan and we pray for Elaine. We lift up Cheyenne Banky who is due on July 14th, their first child. And we give thanks for Jamie and Heather Benversi. Uh, they have a new baby.